Good morning. It's good to see each one of you here this morning. We're going to be speaking this morning on the importance of a number. And you'll see that later on in the message. We have a custom of reading the Word of God and standing for Scripture. Scriptures are printed in your bulletin. Scriptures will be found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham began to Isaac, and Isaac began to Jacob, and Jacob began to Judah, and his brethren. And Judas begat Phares, and Zerah of Thamar, and Phares begat Esrom, and Esrom begat Aram. And Aram begat and Aminah begat and Nassim begat Solomon. And Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon, after who that had the be wife of Israel. Thank you. Be seated, please. By way of introduction, there was a Greek mathematician by the name of Pythagoras. Pythagoras was the first ancient philosopher to recognize the importance of numbers in the scriptures. He taught that everything revolved around numbers. He taught that numbers, weight, and measure were the tools that were used to create the universe. His discovery that numbers permeated everything in every field, whether it be astronomy or chemistry or botany or mathematics, everything is permeated by numbers. Everything is involved with numbers. We live in a number society. We have cell phone numbers. We have home phone numbers. We have zip code numbers. In fact, we are a nation of numbers. We are compounded daily with number after number. We can't pick up the phone without somebody saying, what is your number? He was a great mathematician. He was not a Christian. He was a Greek philosopher, but he did get some light from God on the creation and the use of numbers. For example, in using numbers in connection with astrology and chemistry and botany and mathematics and all these other things, there is some confirmation about his theories. An example would be Isaiah 40 and verse 12. Listen to what our Creator said in these verses. Now most people would just overlook this verse because they don't see a whole lot in it. They don't understand it. But a mathematician would understand it. A person involved in these types of things would see things that the most of us would not see. Listen to Isaiah 40 and verse 12. He's speaking of our Creator and the creation that came from His hand. And He says in verse 12, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of His hand. Here's measurement in creation and meted out heaven with a span. There's a measurement of heaven. 
going on and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. God knows every little grain of dust and sand that exists in this world. He made it all. He knows it all. And He tells Isaiah to pass it on to us. Going on, I read, and weighed the mountains in scales. Who would have ever come up with a, a, a phrase like that? Weighed the mountains. Every mountain you see out here around Chiang Mai has a measurement. God measured it when He made it. Everything He did was absolute perfection. He knows every grain of sand. He knows every drop of dirt or water. He knows everything about creation because He created all of it. Then He says, and the hills in a balance. God balanced the hills. He placed them where He wants them. So our Creator has some agreement here with Pythagoras. Now we don't care much about Pythagoras because he wasn't a Christian, he wasn't a believer, but he did have some light about creation and he came up with these things that everything is affected by certain things. Now there was another philosopher by the name of Plato. Plato came along after Pythagoras and copied him. And he changed it a little bit. And this is what Plato said. Surely I believe and receive that God doth everything by time, number, color, and weight. Now that's something to think about. God does everything by time, by number, by color, and by weight. When he created the heavens, he painted them blue color. When he chose the apostles, he chose them by a number, 12. He created time as the timeless God who knows no time himself realize the need of time and in his moment of creation he cut out a little measure of time he started in eternity came up to a need for time created the time blocked it out gave it to us then he picked right up and went right on with time and into eternity. We're so grateful that He did block out this little bit of time and include us in it. And that's why we're here today. Because God mercifully interrupted His creative powers to block out this little time for you and I to live in, to serve in, to be saved in, and to know Him. Larkin, he was a Baptist, he said God has been called the great geometrician and is said to do everything after a plan. I believe that. I believe that everything God does, He does by a plan. He planned the universe before the ages. He planned our salvation before the ages. He works according to a plan. I have a little memo on my desk. It says, plan your work and work your plan. And I, I attempt to do that in a major. Plan and work. I plan to come here and start a Baptist church. And I did that because I had a plan. I came here with a plan and then I worked the plan and you're part of it this morning. Everything is done by a plan. Now let's consider for a moment the number six. You 
find that in the Bible a lot of times. And I read in Revelation 13 and verse 16 that the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. He's going to come with bloody hands. He's going to come with murderous intent. And he's going to brand all the unsaved with his mark. And those that are saved will be exempt. Will not be here. Let me read that passage. Revelation 13, 16. Notice the number 6. And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Notice that number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding Count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. He has a number, a triple number. Goliath is a type of the Antichrist in his opposition to God's people. And you'll notice an interesting thing about Goliath. When David came down out of the hills and saw that Goliath was blaspheming God and nobody in the camp of Israel could go against him, he said, I'll go against him. And he took his little slingshot, went up the brow of the hill, down through the valley of Elah, and old Goliath said, Son, I'll feed you to the buzzards today. And David said, I come not to you with arrows or bows. I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. Be it known unto you that there is a God in Israel this day. And he threw that slingshot, smacked old Goliath right in the head and killed him. Chopped his head off, carried his head down, put it on the tent of King Saul called all the people of Israel together and said, there's your enemy. He's defeated. You don't have to fear him anymore. He's been conquered. And that's a picture of how Jesus, our David, went down in the valley of Elam and met that vile thing called death. And he slung his spear into it, killed it, took it forever away from us, we will never feel the sting of death. We may die, but we will not be dead. We will be alive in heaven. Our David conquered death because he said, because I live, ye shall live also. I see also that Goliath was six cubits tall, six pieces of armor, and his spear weighed six talents. Why do you think the Holy Spirit saw fit to give us that information? He could have just said he killed Goliath and that's it. But no, he put three sixes into Goliath. Why? Because six is the number of man. And God wants us to know that man is a failure in himself. Then I'd have you to notice that six is seven minus one. Seven is the number of perfection. Wherever you find the number seven, it speaks of perfection. Man is a six. He is one short of perfection. If he were perfect, as the Anglican Methodists say, if they get beyond the fact of sin and they never sin anymore, they're deceiving themselves but nobody else. They're not perfect. They're sixes. If they were perfect, they would be sevens. Man is a six 
He is destitute of God. He doesn't measure up. He's come short of the glory of God. He's a lost sinner. And so he's a six. But God is a seven. God created man. What day of week? Six. In Scripture, there are six different words for man. The main word in Hebrew is aner. But there are five other words all referring to man. And they're always characterized by six. Nebuchadnezzar's idol on the plains of Dura was 60 cubits high, 60 cubits wide. Six instruments were used to worship that idol on the plains of Dura. Why all these sixes? God put them in there because that was man's worship. Nebuchadnezzar was not to be worshipped. God is to be worshipped. So God put all these sixes in the worship of Nebuchadnezzar to let us know that it was man's worship and unacceptable to God. The descendants of Cain were given only as far as the sixth generation. That's the end of man there. Everything about six means man. Wherever you find it, you'll find it everywhere in the Bible. Six is everywhere. Man is to work six days and rest on the seventh. The seventh is the Lord's day. Six is man's day. Then we can go to the number seven. Number seven means perfection, completeness, plenitude, perfectness. Anything that's perfect is considered a seven. God is considered a seven. There are seven days in a perfect week. There are seven colors in a perfect spectrum. Three primary and four secondary colors. There are seven notes of a piano. A perfect scale, but seven octaves. There are seven articles of furniture in the tabernacle. A perfect picture of the Christian life. There are seven eyes in Zechariah 3.9. Speaks of perfect omniscience. Seven is the number that occurs 600 times in the Bible. The seventh day of the week is the Sabbath or the Lord's Day. Silver is purified seven times in the Scripture. In Psalms 12.6, silver purified seven times, completely purified, perfection. Luke 17, 4, a sevenfold sin is mentioned in the Bible, and a sevenfold repentance, and a sevenfold forgiveness. So those three glorious truths that we love, such as our repentance, our forgiveness, our sin, all of that, always is in sevens in the salvation of man. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the Lord wrote to the seven churches. Now there were more than seven churches. There were a church at Hierapolis and other places. But God singled out these seven because they were representative churches. And each one of those seven churches had some difference than any of the others. And he names each one and tells us their faults, their failures, and the good parts about them. But he chose seven to delineate. The Lord's Prayer has seven petitions. You see the sevens everywhere. That's perfection. Now I said all that to say this. I want to go to the number four for a minute. I'm not going to exhaust the number. I'm only going to pick out four women in the Bible. And these four illustrate the principles of salvation. 
in the text that we read, chapter 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. And we have here a listing. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and the life of Urias. It's important to notice how Bathsheba did not get her name used in the scripture. Instead, she's called the wife of Urias. Design in nature is a proof of the existence of God. This genealogy that I read to you this morning and that you read is a proof of divine inspiration of the scripture. In this genealogy, God names four women. They have a place in the royal family of the coming king. They are also representative women because they picture God's way of salvation. Before the four men wrote the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God wrote it through four women. Now this is the only excuse anywhere in the Bible for women preachers. But these four women preach. And I want to show you this morning how they preach. The four of them. It is unusual to find women in a Jewish chronology. It's a unique departure. The Jewish people take no cognizance of the women in their genealogies. They just leave the women completely out. But these four were not left out. This is unusual. Of all the names of women in the Bible, that God would put these four women in here in this genealogy of our Lord. Why did he do that? Because it pictures in type the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. An interesting thing about these four ladies, women, is that they were connected with some great sin. Three of them, with the exception of Ruth. They were all four Gentiles. And the bride of Christ is the church. And the church is a Gentile bride. Jesus is going to take a Gentile bride that's unusual because you would think he would choose a Jewish bride. After all, Jesus was a Jew and the, the Jews married other Jewish women. They didn't marry outside of their Jewish ancestry. And yet these four women were all Gentiles. And God put them in there because he wanted us to know that his church is largely a Gentile church. You know that the Jews today are in unbelief. They don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Occasionally here and there a Jew does, but far and wide the whole Jewish nation is in unbelief. They rejected their lover, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're not going to be in the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ will be a Gentile bride, and all you got to do is count the number of saved people, and then count the number of Jewish people that are saved, and it's almost nothing. Almost all Christians are Gentiles. So, we we'll look at these four Gentile women. Tamar, a Gentile, she was a Canaanite. She was not a Jew. Then there's Rahab, she was a Canaanite. She became the mother of Boaz. Then there was Ruth, a Moabitess, a Gentile. And then there was the wife of Uriah. She was a Hittite. So these four women were all Gentiles. 
all of them connected with some great sin in the Bible. And as it goes on, they are going to be found in the ancestry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are all pictures in type of the bride of Christ. Also, there were four men who wrote four Gospels, and there are four women who teach four Gospels. Only one Gospel, but in four different aspects. Let's take them one by one quickly. The first principle of gospel grace is salvation for sinners. That's Tamar. And in the third verse of Genesis, we read Judas begat Pharaoh's and Sarah of Tamar. Now Tamar's story, I'm not going to tell it. Her story is so sordid, so vile, so wicked that it's not fit or proper for a public reading. You can read it in chapter 38 of the book of Genesis when you go home. But I wouldn't read it in a mixed congregation. Why does her name appear as an ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ? That's a good question. I'll tell you what the answer is. Her name appears because of the record of her sin. The first principle of the gospel is that it's for sinners. Jesus died for sinners. I had a man tell me one time at death's door that he wasn't a sinner. I said, then sir, I have no message for you. Cush died for sinners. Tamar gets in the public record and actually becomes an ancestress of our Lord Jesus Christ because of her sin. God saved Tamar, cleansed her from her sin, and made her one of His own. So the first principle of the Gospel, the first one of these four women is Tamar. And that's where you have to start. You have to start with your sin. You have to come to Christ as a sinner. If you don't come as a sinner, you can't come at all. The Bible says this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ died for sinners. If you leave yourself out as a sinner, you leave yourself out of salvation. I'm glad that he died for sinners like me, like you. She committed incest, adultery, she lied, she deceived her father-in-law, she acted the way of a harlot. She was as bad as you could get. And she's there in the sacred record for our comfort because we are as bad as we can be. And God had mercy on us as He had mercy on Tamar. Amen. I love the Gospel. It tells me that as a sinner, I have a home in heaven because Jesus died for this sinner. And the old hymn writer wrote to the sinners, Come boldly to a throne of grace, ye wretched sinners, come. And lay your load at Jesus' feet and plead what He has done. How can I come, some soul may say. I'm lame and cannot walk. My guilt and sin have stopped my mouth. I sigh but dare not talk. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Though lost and blind and lame, Jehovah is the sinner's friend. And Savior is His name. He makes the dead to hear His voice. He makes the blind to see. The sinner lost, He came to save. And set the prisoner free. Come boldly to the throne of grace. For Jesus fills the throne. And those He kills, He makes alive. 
and sets the sinner free. Poor bankrupt souls who feel and know the hell of sin within, come boldly to the throne of grace. The Lord will take you in. Salvation is for sinners. The th next principle of the gospel is that salvation is by faith. This brings us to Rahab. You may remember the story how Israel marched around the walls of Jericho blowing their trumpets and as they did so the walls of Jericho fell down but just before that battle the spies of Israel had come into the country to spy out the land and they were spotted and they ran for their lives and they ran into an apartment and ran upstairs and hid and there was a lady who owned that apartment and they asked her don't tell them where we are they are going to kill us and when they came and knocked on the door and said does anybody come in here Rahab said nobody came in here I don't know if there is a good lie or not I don't think there is but that, that would have been a good lie she saved the lives of those two spies Israeli spies so that they can go back with their information to their troops. But she said, now that I have saved your lives, I want you to do me a favor. I believe your God is going to come around these walls and I believe that He's going to conquer this city and I want you to spare me and my father's house. They said, we will spare you because of your kindness to us. And when Israel marched around and the walls fell, they said, we want you to be ready. When you see us coming, you hang a scarlet thread out of your window on the wall. And when we see that scarlet thread hanging out of a window on top of this wall, we will spare anyone in the house behind that scarlet thread. What was that scarlet thread that saved her and her father's house? It was a type of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. That scarlet cord was her lifeline. That scarlet cord meant she's one of God's. Spare her. And they did. They spared her. All because they saw the scarlet cord. And you'll be spared because you saw the scarlet cord of Calvary. You saw the blood running down his side. You saw the blood in his hands and feet. You saw the scarlet cord. And you put your trust in that scarlet cord. You put your trust in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the moment you did that, your sins were taken away. You were washed in the blood of the Lamb. Salvation is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from the Daniel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is our salvation. And the, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness, no salvation except by the blood of Jesus Christ. When I was pastoring my first little country church, there was a cultured Eastern woman from New York visited our church and one of the ladies in the church met her on the street and said we're so glad you came to our church last Sunday we hope you'll come back oh she said no I won't come back oh she said didn't the preacher say something wrong yes he did what did he say that was wrong he talked about blood 
all the way through his sermon. He talked about blood. And she said, that's abhorrent to me. I don't like blood. I don't want to hear about blood. But our salvation is by the blood of Christ. Don't tell me about that. I don't want blood. See, that poor lady, if somebody doesn't get to her with the gospel, she'll never be saved. You can't be saved any other way. God said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So we see the scarlet cord. I'm so glad that that poor harlot woman, and Rahab was a harlot. I'm so glad that she put that scarlet cord out for God to have something to put in the Bible that I could see and understand and be saved. I'm so glad that he told us about the scarlet cord of Calvary. There's a river of blood running from the cross of Calvary down to every lost and dying sinner that will receive it. She put her faith in the blood and that saved her. Also, there is a third woman and her name is Ruth. There is no blot on the character of Ruth. She was a pure young woman, but she was a Moabite. God pronounced a curse upon the Moabites. And he tells us why in Deuteronomy 23 in verse 3, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. God shut the Moabites out. That's reprobation. He shut them out. Up to the tenth generation and for all time, forever, the Moabites were rejected of God. Why? Because they fought against Israel and would not let Israel pass through the land. And so that tells us that salvation is by grace. Ruth is the epitome of grace. She said, why have I found grace? In Ruth 2.12, she said, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings Thou art come to trust. She trusted by grace. And grace is the only way of salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith. That is the gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Ruth pictures grace. She was a Moabite. By the very law of God, she was put out but God had a higher law the law shut her out but grace took her in grace is a higher law than the law itself the law cannot match grace the law cannot save anybody for by grace are you saved through faith so Ruth is a picture of the fact that even a rejected Moabite could be taken in. She's the only one. God made an exception. He saved Ruth the Moabite when his own law had shut her out. But he had instituted a higher law, grace. And the law that shut her out could not keep her out because grace had brought her in. Grace brought her in. That shuts all works out of salvation. God does not accept anything that you can do except to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No good works will He ever give you any credit for for salvation. Because grace and law are two opposite things.
under whose wings thou art come to trust. By grace she trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. In tight. Galatians 3.10 says, As many as are under the works of the law are under this curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. You see, we've all broken the law. We've all come under the curse of God. But grace has lifted the curse. Grace has brought us in. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. In looking through my tears one day, I saw Mount Calvary. Beneath the cross there flowed a stream of grace enough for me. Grace flowing from Calvary. Grace as fathomless as the sea. Grace for time and eternity. Grace enough for me. While standing there, my trembling heart, once full of agony, could scarce believe the sight I saw of grace enough for me. When I beheld my every sin nailed to the cruel tree, I felt a flood go through my soul of grace enough for me. When I am safe within the veil, my portion there will be to sing through all the years to come of grace enough for me. And the fourth principle of the gospel of grace is the wife of Uriah. You remember the sad story how David sent the husband of Uriah into the battle deliberately to be killed so he could take Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. And we read in Matthew 1, 6, And Jesse begat David the king. David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah's. Why did God call her the wife of Uriah's instead of calling her Bathsheba? There's a reason why. The saints may sin, but God's faithfulness will never fail. Her name was Bathsheba. But Matthew was directed by the Holy Spirit not to use that name in the holy record of God. Why? Because that name was connected with her sin and her sin had been put away. When she married King David, her sin had all been put away because King David is a type of King Jesus. When she was married to King David, she was married to Jesus in typology. And so God said, no, don't you call her Bathsheba. That's her sin name. You know, the Bible says we have a new name. That was her sin name. So don't you put her name in there. This is my holy book. And she doesn't have a sin name any longer. She's a child of God. She's the wife of the king. She is the wife of Uriah. God forgets and forgives our sins. He said their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. No more. No more Bathsheba's. Just the wife of Uriah. So you would know who she was. It was the sin of a child of God. And that tells us that the fourth principle of the gospel is that the gospel gives eternal life. It's forever and forever and forever. You will never die. You will never be cast off. 
You'll never be separated. Your salvation is forever and forever. Amen. But you say, David sinned. Yes, he did. And you say, what about the covenant of God? What about the coming king? What about the everlasting throne? David has sinned. Yes, David sinned. But God washed away his sin. And you want to know what my answer to that is? To those three questions? What about, what about, what about? I'll tell you what about. God placed the crown on Solomon, his son. And Solomon will bring the royal line from David to Christ and will include the wife of Uriah. That's grace. The fourth principle of the gospel is grace and eternal grace forever. And I have one more thing to come with. When we come to the genealogies of the ancient Jewish people, we find Jesus included in their genealogy. You can read about it in the third chapter of the Gospel of Luke. There you find the genealogy of the Jewish people all the way back to Adam. From Jesus to Adam. And now we turn to the genealogy of the only perfect man, the seven. You say, how do you know Jesus was a seven? It's very easy in the study of typology. Because if you count, the genealogy of our Lord from Jesus all the way back to Adam do you know what number Jesus had? 67 he's the 67th person in the genealogy of the Jewish people and what does it mean? he's the 67 Six. The gospel of man. Seven, the gospel of Christ. Sixty-seven, man, God. Six, man, seven, God. Jesus, sixty-seven, man, in the genealogy of our Lord. What a wonderful thing it is to read that from the 76th generation back to Adam, we find the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. Four, five, six, six and seven, the God-man. What a wonderful book this Bible is. But these things are hidden from the unsaved. They never see these things. They never rejoice in these things because they're hidden from the unsaved. But we know them. We see them. We understand them. We find Jesus in His genealogy. We find Him, the God-man, the six-seven man, the only perfect man. Let's stand together and be dismissed in prayer. Thank you.